This podcast may contain content that is graphic and disturbing in nature. Listener discretion is advised. This mother appeared generous to family and friends and the community, helping those in need. But in reality, she ran a house of horrors, hiding the most shocking of atrocities. This is the Michelle Notech story. Hi, Amy. Hey, Megan. Today's case is one that was suggested by several listeners. Also, I mean, I've been planning on covering it ever since I read the book by Greg Olson detailing the story. If you haven't read it, you should. It's called If You Tell. I highly recommend it if you're interested. Amy, did you read part of this? Are you planning on reading it? Um, I'm actually in the middle of it. Okay, so you do know some of the story, but you won't know every detail because you haven't finished it yet. Correct. But it's very good. Um, So I definitely encourage people who want to know more to take a look at the book. So, okay, uh, before we get to today's case, I wanted to let everyone know, we want to let everyone know that the Tamla Horsford case is now available on Patreon. And this one was one of those really interesting what happened mystery cases. It reminds me of some of our, you know, mystery cases like Cindy James. Or Ellen Ray Greenberg. Right. 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 So I think it's one that it's like one that allows a lot of different theories. And I think we had different ideas. So um, and we had an awesome time chatting with a lot of you about this case in our last Zoom happy hour. It's so much fun to hear your theories and thoughts on these cases as well. So thanks for coming. Yeah. We'd like to take some time to thank our supporters. Amy, who do we have today? I was going to say, Megan, we have a lot of patrons today. We do. So we have Ireland from Columbus, Ohio. Love that name. We also have Sid from Seattle. Hannah Transu. We have Whitley, who, Megan, Whitley is a professional astrologer who is going to do a reading for us. How cool is that? You're kidding me. I'm nope, actually. A, we'll talk I, about that later. I'm afraid to know what's in my stars, but okay. <laughs> and then we have Karen, who listens with her daughter, Sarah and Jess, which is so super cute. And then we have another mom, Allie, who is surprising her daughter, Delaney, with a shout out because they listen to the podcast together. How cool is that? You know, I'm always surprised at how many like we have a lot of mother daughters or families that listen together. It's so neat. It really is. So thank you. We have a couple more, too. We have Angelia, Helen, Shannon Talbot, Rachel, Madison M. from Rockwall. And Amy, I think we also have a friend of yours. My dear friend Justine is now a supporter, which is super cool. And I want to give her a shout out because she is a kick-ass dietitian who runs a really cool Instagram called HonestMom.Nutrition. And she's super witty, super smart. And I think you should all follow her. Love it, Amy. Thank you so much to all of our new and existing supporters. We love it. We appreciate it. And now on to today's episode, the Shelley No Tech Story. Michelle Watson Rivardo Long was born on April 15, 1954, in Battleground, Washington, to couple Les and Sharon Watson. But the marriage did not last long, and after the divorce, Sharon took Michelle, known as Shelley, and I'll be referencing her as Shelley as we go through, to live in California along with her two younger brothers, Paul and Chuck. Les was known as kind of a catch around town, and he remarried a woman named Lara Stallings, who said that she was taken with Les's good looks and also believed him when he said that he was only four years older than her. But she later found out, in reality, he was 10 years older than her. Not sure that's a great sign, you know, lying about your age from the start, but they got married, and not long after they married, Sharon called Les and said that she could no longer care for their children. Sharon suffered from alcoholism and had taken up with a bad crowd. It was rumored that she may have been engaged in prostitution as well. So not a lifestyle that was, you know, good for children. Shelly was about six at the time, and Lara was nervous about having, you know, these new children, her stepchildren in the house, but said that she understood that there was no choice, and so she was going to step up. Once Sharon dropped off the children, she would never come back again. Not long after, she was actually murdered in a motel you know, a very traumatic event. Do we know who killed her? She was murdered by a boyfriend or an acquaintance. Wow. I- I'm not sure if it was a drug exchange or, you know, if what happens in that case, but she was murdered. And so 
Lara had no idea for what she was in for, to be honest, because Shelley exhibited early bad behaviors, such as lying and doing poorly in school. She was unhappy, Shelley demanded a lot of attention, and she was very mean early on, Lara said. In Greg Olson's book, Lara said that Shelley would hurt the other children by putting broken glass in their shoes if she felt like she wasn't getting enough attention. So Lara was, you know, she, she discussed it in the book. She's like, look, I, I knew there was going to be problems. You know, their mother had abandoned them and then she died. But I didn't know the extent to which Shelley was going to be this problematic. At age 15, Shelley accused her father of raping her. But a physical examination would confirm that she had never been sexually assaulted. Lara stated that she knew Shelley was lying, but this was the typical type of toxic behavior Shelley was known for. So the goal eventually for Lara and Les, really after trying, they tried so hard to make this nice family life. They said their goal was just to get Shelley out of the house. As she was getting older, they were just like focusing on moving past her. Were they getting her any help or anything? I, I mean, I do know that she met with a psychologist when she was evaluated for that sexual assault, but I, I'm not sure. I don't think she was in therapy otherwise. And I also think it was pre the days of when therapy was very mainstream. You know what I mean? And I know her younger brothers had other behavioral issues, but Shelley's were much, much worse, I think, or much more pronounced. Shelley had even stayed with Lara's parents for a bit and attended a boarding school. But after completing the first year, the school said she could not return the following year because she was just too much trouble. Shelley bounced around, staying with other family members as well. But by the time she was 18, she had met her first husband, Randy. Um, now her family, Les, offered Randy a job and basically a place to live and anything else he wanted just because they wanted to get Shelley off their hands. Shelley began working in the field of healthcare as an aide and got pregnant with her first child named Nikki in 1974. But the relationship with Randy wouldn't last long, and he would leave her eventually saying he couldn't take it, her behavior, her rage, her everything. That's going to be the common theme, just so you know, as we go through this. Everyone said Shelley had rage. Nobody blamed Randy, but Lara worried about Nikki and tried to keep Shelley close for the sake of keeping an eye on the child. Shelley then met and married another man named Danny Long, with whom she had an even more tumultuous relationship. And they had another child named Samantha, known as Sammy. But Danny and Shelley also would eventually split. Now, at the age of 24, Shelley was a single mother with two children by two different fathers. And it was around this time in 1982 that she met David Notek, a former Vietnam veteran. Everyone described, just so you know, Shelly as a very, very beautiful and vivacious woman. Dave was a nice guy, an eligible bachelor who worked on heavy machinery and who was a bit down on his luck because he had just been dumped by a recent girlfriend. Well, so he went out and he met, you yeah. know, he went out like just to have, I think, a burger and a beer, it said. And he wound up meeting Shelly in a bar. And he thought that she was just the most beautiful woman he had ever met. They started dating, and within a month, they had moved into a house together in Raymond, Washington, where Shelley was basically a stay-at-home mom for the most part, and David worked in construction. Dave was crazy also about Shelley's girls, too, and the pair eventually married in 1987. The town of Raymond, let me just point out, had sort of a rustic nature to it and kind of a feeling of isolation. And I want to say that now because I want you to keep that in mind. This isolation that was, you know, kind of felt there would come to play a role in the events that would unfold later on. The couple, Shelly and David, they also took in Shelly's nephew, Shane Watson, who was 12 at the time and whose father was unstable and his mother was deceased. He was having a lot of tr trouble with his family members handling him, but Shelly volunteered to take him in and the family was so grateful and so happy about it. At first, Shane found a fatherly figure in Dave who really took Shane under his wing, and it seemed a happy household for a time. But soon, Shelley would begin degrading Shane, forcing him to sleep on the floor and working him really to the bone. That was the description that she gave Shane so many chores that he had to work basically from the moment he woke up till the moment he went to bed. She took his bed from him and like forced him to sleep on the floor, which would be, become a pattern. And, you'll, and the, the behavior gets much worse, just so you know. In 1989, Dave and Shelley also had a daughter of their own named Tori, but the happy times definitely would not last. And early on, Dave found out that Shelley's temper was explosive. Unfortunately, he was kind of the passive compliant type, 
So Shelley was able to control him very easily right from the beginning. And anytime Dave talked or thought about leaving, Shelly was really smart. She would turn on the charm, right? Um, it's kind of like an abuser. I'm like, no, 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 I'm going to be sweet. Things are going to be better. And Dave said that he also really loved the girls. He just knew that Shelly wasn't quite right. But at the time, he had no idea how wrong things would eventually go when a family friend would come to stay. By the way, there are now seven people in this small house, if anyone wants to look it up. It's, it's not big. It does not look like it can accommodate seven people. So there'd be some closed quarters. Now, who is this friend who came to stay with them? Her name was Kathy Loreno. She was Shelly's hairdresser, and Kathy had been living with her mother. See, Kathy had moved to Aberdeen for a new job and a promotion, but she lost her job and broke up with a boyfriend, and then she had to move back home with her mom. But the problem was some members of her family weren't happy about the arrangement. You see, Kathy was very kind and had been very generous to her mother over the years. But even so, her brother insisted that Kathy pay rent. But Kathy was on hard time. She didn't have any money. And so really out of shame, she left without telling her family where she was going. Now, Kathy was depressed and broke, but she did have one thing, Amy. She had the support of her good friend named Shelly Notek. And when Kathy could no longer afford this rent, Shelly offered Kathy a place to stay in the no-tech home so long as Kathy would just help with the children. So for Kathy, this was perfect. I mean, she'd have a place. Shelly and her were good friends. And so this arrangement she thought would be ideal. She had no idea what it would become. They moved to a five-acre property in 1990 because it was bigger, but it was also much more private, more isolation. And that would prove to be very problematic. Kathy was a loyal follower of Shelly, though, right from the start. Shelly used to do this thing where she lied a lot, and she would claim that she had cancer, often, uh, though she would never actually get sick. So Lara talked about this, you know, her stepmother in the book, that Shelly would tell Lara that cancer had come back until, uh, basically, until Lara told her, I don't believe you. <laughs> this is not true. This is not how cancer works. This infuriated Shelly, which prompted Dave to call Lara and say that he took Shelly to chemo. And so he was saying, no, she really had it. But when he was pressed, Dave admitted that he never spoke with the doctor and Shelly would never let him go inside with her. And he said it was because she was too proud. So she was faking going to chemo treatments. Lara said, I have no idea what she did. Like maybe she went out the back door and went shopping all day just to like torture Dave. But Kathy was, you know, supportive and she also defended Shelly. She said that she would never lie about cancer. In the end, though, there was never any proof that Shelly Notek suffered from any type of cancer. I have to tell you, though, she went to extremes. Like, she would shave her eyebrows off and, you know, do other things to keep up with this facade. She had told Dave, I forgot to mention this, in the beginning when they met, she had told Dave that they probably wouldn't be together long because she was pretty sure she was dying of cancer. But she didn't have cancer then. This was just a reoccurring theme for attention, I think. Oh, I can't wait to talk about theories. Oh, yeah. Oh, oh yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> okay, they moved into this house in 1990. And the last time anyone saw Kathy Loreno was around 1994. She was just gone all of a sudden. When she suddenly disappeared, the police came to ask questions. And Shelley said that Kathy had met a new man and taken off with him. That he was a trucker and that they were traveling. Shelly even presented police with postcards from various places across the country, uh, allegedly from Kathy. And so the police were somewhat convinced that Kathy was just fine, just living her life, traveling with her new boyfriend. She had already had a family rift, if you recall. So it didn't seem that strange that she would pick up and leave. Why not, right? Police investigated, though, and they couldn't find any paper trail of Kathy spending, working, or existing at all. Nevertheless, they didn't quite know, like they were suspicious, but they didn't know what happened to her. And they had no reason to believe that Shelly was lying. And they had the postcards as proof. So about a year after Kathy disappeared, 17-year-old Shane Watson, Shelly's nephew, was reported missing by Shelly herself. Um, and so this was in February 1995. But then a few days later, she called the police and claimed that Shane had contacted her, said that he left for a fishing boat job in Alaska. And, you know, she didn't hear from him directly, but she received a postcard. So are you hearing the theme here? Again, she's receiving a postcard from Shane and said she received others, just like she said with Kathy. So now just keep in mind, you have two people that have gone missing who have had no contact with anyone else. 
except for Shelly, and only via postcard. And nobody is catching on yet? Well, no, not yet. I will say this, though. By 2001, Shelly's daughter, Nikki, who had left home, contacted the police and told them what she knew had happened to Kathy Loreno, and she gave a bombshell statement. So here's what she told them. Nikki said that Shelly had tortured Kathy and eventually murdered her. Shelly brought Kathy in, but slowly, and this was her pattern, she would begin to demean Kathy and degrade her. So she would start calling her, Kathy was a heavier woman, and so she would call her fat all the time. And she would say that she was a pig. And so she started with verbal abuse, but then she moved on to actually physical abuse. Shelly knew how to win people over immediately, but then uh, turn that attention into control. In the years that Kathy lived with the Notex, she endured extreme abuse and torture. So much so, Amy, that she would lose 100 pounds while she lived with them. She was beaten by Shelly regularly, uh, starved. She was forced to do housework naked and crawl on the floors. And f- this was all for Shelly's pleasure and because Shelly said that Kathy was ungrateful and she had to learn a lesson. And this was all in front of the children? Oh, yeah. Well, wait till we get to that. Shelly also didn't allow Kathy to bathe. Instead, she would hose her down outside no matter what time of year it was, and clean her with bleach while Kathy cried, all the while Shelly yelling at her saying it was for her own good and that she was helping her. But really, she was slowly and painfully killing the woman, who was absolutely terrified of defying Shelly. Shelly, by the way, you had asked about the children. She did the same with all of her children. She beat them regularly. She starved them. She locked them in closets without access to bathrooms. Uh, this was her big thing. Everyone had to ask permission to use the bathroom or to take a shower. She withheld showers. The girls described like that they would maybe get a shower a week. Did the girls not, did they not go to school, the children? They did go to school. They said they were able to kind of mask the bruises, mask the smell. Like they were able to mask most of what was going on. They never cried for help. They were too scared. Uh, Sammy uh, cried for help at one point. Uh, I think I get to that later in the story, but then she was so afraid mm-hmm. she recanted her story because she was terrified of her mother. Everyone was terrified of Shelly. So she beat the children regularly again. She would hose them down at night. She had them crawl outside, like on the cold, muddy ground. Um, a lot of times she had them do this naked. She had a thing with uh, nudity that we'll address as well. She forced them to abuse Kathy in front of her. So she would yell at them to beat Kathy up, to hurt her, hurt her, show her, teach her a lesson. This is what she did to her, her children. But let's get back to Kathy. She had moved Kathy to the oil burner room in the basement. Like she kept slowly moving her. First she had a room. Then she had a smaller room. Then she didn't have a bed. This was like a thing that Shelly did. Then she moved her into this awful place in the house. And then she moved her into the pump house outside. And from there, things went downhill progressively. Kathy lost her hair. She lost most of her teeth. She was always battered, bleeding, bruised, and weak. She couldn't even comprehend things anymore. Was she being fed like just a bare minimum to keep her alive? Yes. Yeah, no, that, that was a regular thing Shelly did with starve people. She was, she was dying in front of them. And one day when Shelly was out, Shane and Nikki, they went out to the pump house and they tried to let Kathy out. They opened the pump house door and told her to run. You know, this is outside. But Kathy was so defeated and so scared. She curled up in the corner and said, no, no, shut the door. Leave me, leave me. She wouldn't leave. She wouldn't run. Both Shane and Nikki knew that day they said that Kathy was going to die. And she did, eventually succumbing to all of it and choking on her own vomit. Too weak to do anything about it and likely brain damage from all the beatings. The kids described to Kathy, who wasn't there anymore for quite some time. Shelly called all of this abuse wallowing, like it was her euphemism for the inflicted torture. And it could include different things. You know, wallowing might be the cold hosing down or it might be beating them, or it might be starving them. But this was the common term that she used. She loved the physical abuse, clearly, but she also liked to inflict mental abuse on the girls. So what do I mean? Like she would, she'd give them a Christmas present, but then she would take it back immediately. Or she would, they said she did this regularly. She would accuse them of losing something and then punish the girls physically or withhold sleep Only to find out, like the girls would only find out later herself, like Shelly was just taking these things and then accusing them and using this as an excuse to punish them. So what they lived with was constant physical, mental, and emotional torture. She would force Shane and Nikki, 
cousins to slow dance nude in the living room. The nu- I think that uh, this Sick. is, I think, another. I think the nudity was, uh, she had a very clear and odd obsession with it. I think it was just a way to further degrade her victims, to be honest. Mm-hmm. Where is Dave this whole time? Right. Dave also participated in the abuse, but it was at the behest of Shelly always. You didn't say no to Shelly Notek. And once Kathy and Shane were gone, Shelly began to go after Nikki viciously, having her sleep outside and do yard work in the nude, taking her clothes away from her for school. So she had no school clothes. She had like one outfit. I mean, I don't know how nobody noticed this. But Nikki was also getting older and stronger, and she began to fight back. So Shelly sent her to Dave's sister Trisha's house, which turned out to be a very good thing. And even though she returned to Washington to Shelly's home briefly, She got a job cleaning motel rooms, and the owner offered her a mobile home to stay in. And so she said yes, and this was really her ticket to freedom. So Nikki was out of the house. And that was when she summoned up the courage to go to the police. But after her initial interview, Nikki went into hiding, fearing her mother's recourse and really refusing to cooperate afterward. And so the police didn't really pursue things any further because Nikki stepped back and they couldn't find her. They literally couldn't find her. She literally went into hiding. Nikki, while living there, had, you know, been Shelly's target. And her younger sister, Sammy, was able to find more of her mother's favor. So she was able to dodge a lot of the abuse. Don't get me wrong. Sammy was victimized as well. It just happened to be that her mother favored her. But she was also, Sammy was plotting an escape of her own. So first she tried going to college, but her mother sabotaged her admission forms and she missed enrollment. So she escaped by staying with her grandmother, Lara. But Sammy eventually returned to her parents' house in exchange for help with college tuition. She was stronger now, too, and she challenged Shelly on her lies. Plus, even though she came home, she was actually away at college, so she would just come home, you know, briefly, uh, but she wasn't living there permanently. The problem was, with Nikki and Sammy out of the house, Tori, their much younger sister, who was just 13 or 14 at the time, who had never felt the brunt of her mother, was the only target left. And so she described her mom, you know, had started to abuse her. She said that the first time her mother just hit her really hard. And I think she hit her head on something and she was bleeding. And she was she was in shock that her mom had like done this to her. But then her abuse just escalated towards Tori because she was the only target left. And she would routinely have Tori take off her clothes to measure her progress through puberty, examining her breasts and pubic hair. I, this is it's so sick. I, I mean, Tori described like, I knew this was wrong. Like, I knew nobody would do that. Like, whose mother would do this? I felt so uncomfortable. But she insisted that she had to see. So while the abuse did continue with Tori, it got better because Shelly found a new target. 57-year-old Ronald Woodworth had just experienced a breakup with his long-term partner, and he now found himself jobless, homeless, and heartbroken. He moved to Raymond, Washington, where his family was from, and he was befriended by none other than Shelly Notek. So she loved just preying on vulnerable people. Yes, and she was obviously very smart about picking her targets. She picked people who were vulnerable emotionally, but also those who had financial economic struggles. So yes. How did he know Shelly? I guess Shelly had once cared for Ron's elderly mother. Remember I said she was a healthcare aide? And when Ron had no place to stay, Shelly offered, come live with us. So Ron moved in with the Notek family in 2001 when Shelly once again offered to open her home to down-on-his-luck Ron. By now, the police had been warned that there was another guest in the Notek house who might be in danger. But even though the police would check in on Ron, if the police would come and Ron would see them, Ron would run away from them. He would be in the yard. He was also in the yard a lot. That was Shelly's thing too, yard work. But he would, he was so afraid of Shelly. You know, she quickly did the same, like the demeaning process, the degradation, the abuse, that he would run from the police fearing Shelly's wrath. During this time also at the instruction of Shelly, Ron began caring for a man named James McClintock, a.k.a. Mac, someone Shelly had met because she had also cared for his mother and someone with whom Tori had become close. And then suddenly Mac died from a fall, which Shelly said happened when Ron was with him. So this was suspicious, and Mac actually designated his dog, Sissy, as the benefactor of his inheritance, but Shelly was going to be the guardian of Sissy, and Shelly said that Sissy had died. So as Sissy's guardian, she would de facto get Mac's inheritance, which was something like $135,000. 
In the meantime, Shelley tortured Ron, withholding food and showers, forcing him to work outside in the nude, forcing him, not once, twice, to jump off the roof of their house. And then when he wounded his feet so badly, she tended to his wounds with boiling water and bleach to the point where it burned his skin off. So Dave was still around for all this? It's interesting that you asked that because Dave is around, but he's not. He takes jobs, like long-term construction jobs, so he's not in the house a lot. He comes back on weekends. Was she sexually abusing Ron? I would say no, but yes, I I think forced nudity and, and, and touching is sexual abuse. Mm-hmm. Um, I, But I don't know mm-hmm. of further sexual abuse, I would say. Mm -hmm. Then Ron disappeared. So this is Shelley's third house guest who's gone missing. And in 2003, Nikki and her sister Sammy came back to the police again. They were older and stronger now, but they were really worried about Tori. Tori was 14 and living at home, and they knew that she was the only one left for Shelley to torture. So they told their story again. They told them about Kathy, but they also informed the police that Ron had now gone missing. And when the police went to talk to Shelly, she said that Ron, you know, ran away with someone to California, met someone. Same story. But the police, you know, this time they went to the home. This time they were they weren't taking Shelly's word for it. They removed 14 year old Tori from the home. And immediately when they got Tori out, she told them they needed to come back with a search warrant because Shelly and Dave had hidden some of Ron's stuff out back. But she said, if you if you don't come back right away, I'm sure my parents are going to burn this. But his some of his stuff is still here. Dave went to the police station the next day to try to get his daughter back. Shelly made him because she was incensed that someone would remove Tori from the home. But police used this instead as an opportunity to question Dave. So at first, he denied that Shelly abused anyone. But Dave conceded that Kathy had died by a slip in the house, a slip and fall, and they covered it up because they feared they'd be suspected of foul play. So yes, he's admitting that that she she died, and yes, we covered it up. Did they have our body? Dave Notek actually burned her body and threw her ashes in the ocean. Dave also claimed that Ron had died by suicide from overdosing on medications, and he had buried Ron's body on the property because there was a burn ban, and he could not burn him. So for some people who may not know, it's legal. I don't know which states, but it is legal in some states and it is in Washington to burn your trash on your property. But at this time, there was a a burn ban. So he said that Ron's body was buried on the property. Well, what do you think happened? Dave was arrested and it came out then that Shelley also tortured Ron, beating him and starving him and boiling his feet. Did he turn on Shelley or came out via the girls? It's a good question, Amy. I'm about to address it, I think. Dave was arrested right there, and they descended onto the home right away with a search warrant to search, you know, Tori's out of there, but they ha- they wanted a search warrant to find Ron's body. And in August of 2003, the home was, the no-tech home was searched by the sheriff's department, and they dug up the backyard while the media waited out front, wondering what was going on here. They also arrested Shelly no much to her surprise, of course. They did find Ron's body on the property, but not Kathy Moreno. Obviously, I told you she was burned. But they also found an unidentified bone fragment. And when they brought Dave back to the property, they received another big shock. Dave revealed that he had killed Shane, too. And he pointed out the location in the yard where he did it. Why kill Shane? Shelly had convinced Dave, who was very much under her control, that she had to kill Shane because Shane had threatened to tell the police what Shelly did to Kathy. She was obsessed with it for uh, like that year. She believed that Shane was going to call the police. And sadly and unfortunately, there was an incident that Nikki talks about, and she regrets it so much later, where she found some pictures that Shane had of Kathy, and it showed how bad in shape Kathy, you know, was in. And she showed her mother and she said she doesn't know why she showed her mother. Maybe she was afraid of her. Maybe she wanted to please her anything. But that may have been, she thought, one of the factors that led her mother to believe that Shane was going to rat on them. So Shelly told Dave to kill Shane. And that's just what he did. He shot him in the back of the head with a rifle and he burned Shane's body, throwing his ashes in the ocean like he did with Kathy's. The police didn't find any additional remains on the property, but the house had some damning evidence. Those photographs and videos of Kathy losing lots of weight and crawling naked on the floors and being beaten. And it turns out, in an, another odd twist, that Sissy, remember Sissy Max Dog, mm-hmm. was alive and well and found on Shelley's property. Dave and Shelley were both charged with murder in the second degree, 
but they only had the body of Ron Woodward. The bone fragment found on the property could have been from anyone, could have been from an animal. And so this was going to be a really challenging case. And it turns out they wouldn't need to try it, though. Dave confessed to everything. In exchange for his cooperation, he received a plea bargain and a sentence of 15 years in prison. But he would not testify against Shelley because of spousal privilege. So he did tell the police, but he wouldn't testify against her. He was released in 2016 and works at a seafood processing plant. And he has maintained a relationship with Tori and Sammy. However, Nikki will not speak to him ever again. He was never abusive to his own children, as far as we know. He was at Shelley's direction, but most of the abuse came from her. He talked about how guilty he felt and how wrong he knew it. He knew it was wrong the whole time, but he was just so afraid of Shelley. Everyone was. Sammy was granted custody of Tori, and they moved to an apartment where Sammy raised Tori with much better memories, luckily. Nikki went on to get married and have children, Sammy too. And all three women went on to have careers, and they all stayed close with one another. Shelly Notek entered an Alford plea. Just so people um, who don't know, an Alford plea is a plea bargain where you plead guilty without admitting guilt. So you acknowledge that the state has enough proof to prosecute and convict you, but you maintain your innocence. I'm not surprised that that was the plea she took. She received the maximum sentence of 22 years for second degree murder. That's her maximum. Oh, why couldn't they? They couldn't get her on first degree? No. They, they said they, they just could not, uh, they could not have made a case. They knew they couldn't make a case. Did they charge her for all the abuse charges other than second degree murder? Yeah, there, there was other charges, um, but this was the max charge and the max sentence. She's up for parole in 2022. None of her daughters will be there to speak on her behalf and none have spoken with her for years. They all have stated, uh, or at least I know two of them have stated that they believe she'll always pose a danger if released. Incredible, right? I'm sorry. Was she was she sentenced to 22 and then she maxes out? No, she's she's sentenced to 22 and she's up for parole at 18 because of good time. Uh, 18 years. She's up for parole. She's 67, I think. OK, so she potentially has another four years before maxing out. That's correct. But it's looking like she's uh, I read an article that said it looks like she's going to be granted parole next year. And I'm assuming her daughters want nothing to do with her. Nothing. Mm. Has she expressed remorse at all? No. Or taken responsibility? No. No, not that I know of. I have no idea what she'll say to the parole board, but. She said she said minimal things like I know I should have helped Kathy like, you know, not that I abused and killed. She won't like admit to that kind of torture. I mean, this case is really unbelievable. Do you have any theories before I get into mine? Theories on Shelley? Yeah. Jeez. I mean, there's this is one of those cases where you see nature and nurture. It seems like there's something going on biologically. Actually, her mother, there was no history of criminal behavior, but it seems like there may have been history of addiction and Mental health? Alcoholism, for sure. Alcoholism. Okay, so clearly something going on biologically. But I also, if you look at the environment that she grew up in, she experienced a lot of trauma at a young age. So it doesn't surprise me that she had trouble because she was not given the support she needed during those traumatic times. Children who experience trauma at such a young age require a lot of support and help to overcome that. And it, it sounds like she was failed by a lot of adults in her life. You know, I think she was failed by her mother. And I think her father also tried, but I think he he also used to kind of cave to her demands, is what Lara said. Like, he would spoil her no matter what. So I think she learned at an early age, too, that she could get what she wanted by acting a certain way. But here's what I'm going to go with. Uh, I'm going to guess that Shelley's mother drank while she was pregnant because she was a known alcoholic, but also because in the 1950s, it was still acceptable to drink alcohol while pregnant. And so I'm going to say that Shelley was probably born with some neuropsychological deficits, perhaps with her temper or other abilities to regulate her emotions. So this is just an educated guess, which is the best I can do. But then Shelley finds herself with a mother who cannot correct these deficiencies. She can't correct this behavior. Lara said that early on, Shelley lied, fought, had very bad behavior, temper issues. So I think what she was describing is conduct disorder. Mm -hmm. and. This conduct disorder accumulated into lifelong behavior for Shelley. She comes under lifelong antisocial behavior. Do you know which theory was, that I'm going yeah. with? Well, I was thinking of, you know, she's definitely a life course persister, chronic career criminal, all of those. You know, we talk about how most people age out of crime and some people don't. When you see issues from such a young age, uh, it's not surprising. Correct. So I'm going with this is Terry Moffitt's theory of life course persistent offenders mm -hmm. who are born with deficits that aren't corrected and then they turn into lifelong offending. 
Shelley's outlet for her anger, and I believe she was very angry, was sadism. Um, so she's also sadistic. She relished from the pain and the torture of others, and often sadism coexists with personality disorders. And while not officially diagnosed, I'd say she was a psychopathic sadist, which comes with lifelong criminal behavior as well. Am I wrong that I've heard some people refer to her as a serial killer? I would absolutely refer to her as a serial killer. How many people I could have... Unless I lost count, Ron and Kathy. Well, no. See, Dave, Ron and Kathy died by her hands, but she ordered yes. her husband to kill Shane. So I'm going to say that she's responsible for that. And that's her nephew. So I'm going to say three victims qualifies her. When you look at the definition of a serial killer, it doesn't have to be at your own hands. It, it depends on who you ask, because some say Manson was a serial killer. But remember, Manson never killed anyone. Yeah. The okay. family did. Right. Um, so there's a there's debate in the field about whether or not mm -hmm. I would put Shelley as a, definitely a serial killer, in my opinion. Last issue here, Amy, is did the criminal justice system get it right? No. Yeah, for me, it's an overwhelming <laughs> no. <laughs> no. As you just said, the husband, I mean, might not argue him, but she's a serial killer. They killed, I mean, they're responsible for three deaths and cover-ups. So I think the two should have been incarcerated a, a lot longer. Megan, we both work with people who are serving 30 to life for nonviolent drug offenses. Yes. So if you have people that are serving sentences, like the fact that she's eligible for parole after 18 years, after what she did, the abuse alone, not to mention the fact, obviously, that she murdered people. It's shocking to me. I know that the prosecution might have had a hard time establishing like premeditation, but I don't know. This is a case where either I think they should have tried or the sentences should be longer. I can't believe Dave Notek is out and I cannot believe Shelley Notek is getting out next year. I think she's definitely a, a threat still. Isn't torture and child abuse considered like an aggravating factor, even for second degree murder? I would think so. But I guess they wanted her to take a plea. So they gave her a plea that she yeah. would, you know, take that would yeah. agree to. Uh, I think also, to be honest, last thing I'll say is I'm not sure they wanted to subject all the girls to testifying. Understand. Uh, I think that would have mm -hmm. been a, a thing they didn't want to do either. So yeah, but now the girls are going to have to deal with the fact that this woman is going to be out in the sh on the streets. I know. I don't and I, I don't know if she'll try to contact them or what will happen. I mean, I definitely am afraid she's one of those people that I, I'm afraid that she's going to be in society. I think that she has very strong potential to reoffend. I mean, so she'll be um, she'll be paroled in Washington state. Is that correct? That's correct. In the end, this is a tragedy. But the three girls survived and they formed tighter bonds with each other. They went on to live their lives. Um, but when Shelly leaves prison, as I said, I feel for the safety that anyone she crosses paths with, because there are some people for whom. There is no such thing as rehabilitation, and Shelly Notek is one of those people. Couldn't agree more. Megan, thank you so much. Of course. Before we go today, we'd like to take this opportunity to answer questions from our patrons. Um, some very interesting questions today, and I'm going to kick us off with the first one. And that is, do you think Rose West could be classified as a sexual sadist or lust killer? And that's from Rachel. I'm going to go ahead and take it since I cover serial murder and she was um, a serial offender along with her husband, Fred West. I think the correct answer here is that she was both. She was a lust killer in that killing gave her sexual pleasure, um, very sexually motivated crimes. But Rose and Fred West were also extremely sadistic and they really enjoyed inflicting pain in ways that not all serial killers actually do. Even if they derive pleasure from the sexual killing, they don't always need to torture their victims and see that pain. But I think that Rose West absolutely did. So I think she qualifies in both categories. Okay, thank you for that question. Our next question is from Madison. And Madison wants to know, what is the most unusual case you worked on or studied? Megan, I think we have the same one on three. Ready? One, two, three. Cindy, Cindy James. James. <laughs> <laughs> well, you got my point. Okay, so I'd have to say Cindy James. There are so many cases I'm really interested in. You know, Lavina Johnson is one I always say also, but um, thank you for that question. Hannah wants to know what made you get into teaching about crime? I'll go first, Megan. For me, during grad school, the opportunity presented itself. So I figured, why not? And then I absolutely loved it because I find all of this stuff so fascinating and interesting, and it's really a blessing to be able to make a career out of something you're passionate about. So that's mine. Um, I was actually a teacher's assistant uh, when I was in college for a public speaking course, and I loved it. 
accept public speaking, you know, was a part of how I would deliver content, but it wasn't what I wanted to do. So I knew really from college on that I loved the idea of teaching a course. And when I connected with crime and criminology, having loved that content so much, it was easy for me to envision being able to teach about a subject I was so passionate about. I also thought, frankly, when I worked in the system that I saw a lot of people whose perceptions were not what I would want for the future of criminal justice. And I thought it would help to be able to prepare um, students for critical issues that, that we need to deal with in the future. Good, thank you. Do you want to read the next question from Sid? Sure. When do you think that the perception that women, especially wealthy women like Lizzie Borden, um, couldn't be murderers began to change? I'm fascinated by how society once deemed, quote, ladies incapable of crime. As I teach women in crime, I can tell you that there are a couple of different, you know, um, phases, but the most significant was the 1970s with women's lib. And this was really the time that chivalry in the system towards women began to change. We demanded equality and our male counterparts started to give us equality in the system and began studying women as female offenders who had the same capabilities as males. So I think the most significant change came in the 1970s. All right, Megan, I'm going to take the next one from Karen. So Karen wanted to know if we've been to Australia, but she says, I know Amy doesn't like to fly. But guess what? Amy loves to fly and Megan doesn't <laughs> like to fly. And and I have to tell you, Karen, I have been to Australia and I absolutely fell in love with Tim Tams and myself and a colleague actually bought a duffel bag just so that we can take all these Tim Tams home. Because while they do sell Tim Tams in some flavors here, they do not have all of them. And Vegemite, not my favorite. I don't like when things are too salty, but I know everyone loves it. But Tim Tams are the best thing ever. So I love that question, Karen. Thank you so much. <laughs> Amy, are those are Tim Tams those yummy cookies? Oh, yes. Did, did I give you them when I got back? I think you did, yeah. Yeah, okay. I'm surprised. I ate most of them on my way home. Um, <laughs> but I'm not kidding. I didn't. I, I definitely bought tons, I think like two dozen of them. I did not come home with that many, but they're fabulous. I'm so, I'm so glad I gave you a pack of Tim Tams. That's so nice. Yeah, okay. thank you, Amy. That was thoughtful. You probably had about 100 <laughs> packs. Thanks for giving me one. <laughs> All right. And lastly, Allison wants to know, if bias was taken out of solving crimes, would they be solved faster? Very interesting question. I am going to say no. Mm -hmm. They would be solved much slower. Mm -hmm. However, there would be much more accurate convictions, much less wrongful convictions. I also want to point out that I don't think it's possible to take bias out because no matter how hard we try, a lot of different forms of biases are subconscious. I just want you to know that my exact that was my exact answer. I read that and the first thing I thought was absolutely not. They'd be solved slower, but they'd be more accurate. I agree 100 percent. Thank you, everyone, for the thoughtful questions. We love them. You can keep them coming. We could probably do a whole episode just answering these questions. So we appreciate it. And uh, we'll see you next time on Women in Crime. Women in Crime is written and hosted by Megan Sachs and Amy Schlossberg. Our producer and editor is James Varga. Music composition is by Dessert Media. If you enjoy the show, please remember to subscribe and leave a review. You can also support the show while gaining access to ad-free episodes, exclusive AMAs, and other bonus content for a small monthly contribution through Patreon. For more information, visit patreon.com slash women in crime. Sources for today's episode include If You Tell by Greg Olson, The New York Post, an episode of Snapped, The U.S. Sun, and The Seattle Post Intelligencer. Seattle Post Intelligencer. Seattle Post Intelligencer. Seattle Post Intelligencer.